Yeah, hello, everybody. As they already mentioned, my name is uh, Radoslav Stankov, but everybody calls me Rado. Uh, you can find me on the internet as R. Stankov pretty much everywhere. I come from a country in Europe called Bulgaria. It's a country between Greece and Turkey. <laughs> I'm also one of the authors of this full stack uh, tutorial for GraphQL, which basically implements Hacker News with various backend and frontend technologies and shows how you can use GraphQL in different cases. Also, except the circus, I organized uh, NotaConf in uh, about React in Sofia. This year would be on 9th of May, after my birthday. It will be a wild party. And the thing I'm going to talk about today is Product Hunt, where I'm head of engineering. Uh, because I would show a lot of code and a lot of links, all my slides, this will be basically my last slide, all my presentations are at this URL. Because I'm speaking quite fast, changing slides, and sometimes people can't catch up to make a photo on time. So, yeah, just be prepared. Uh, this will be the last slide if you want the links. Also, I'll tweet, ab uh, tweet about the links afterwards. So, in software engineering, there is something which is thing that the context is king. We cannot make good decisions if we know, don't know the context. Like, all the stuff I'm going to talk about today is about my context, my company's context, and some of this hopefully would be very applicable to you. So Product Hunt is still in the startup mode. So we are in this mode where we move fast and have breakfast. <laughs> because that's the most important meal of the day. Uh, Product Hunt is actually quite a small company. This is all our team. We are just 20 people at the moment. And this is our engineering team. Some of them are here today, like this guy here and this guy over here. Uh, so, Product Hunt uh, started as a small website. So, this is Product Hunt yesterday, screenshot. And if we see the Product Hunt's history, it's quite volatile. We started as a jQuery spaghetti. When I, started, when I joined the company, we moved to Backbone. In 2015, we moved to React. 2015, something called Flux appeared, which we implemented in May, and in December we switched it to Redux because it appeared in <laughs> July. We became a full page application in 2016, and in 2017, in February, like beginning of February, like three years ago, uh, we moved to GraphQL. And I can imagine our code base of with all of those transitions, most of them are actually done already. Uh, there is some battle scars left, so earlier last year, in April 2019, we started a new product in, in, inside Product Hunt, which is called Your Stack, which is basically a place where people can share the stacks they're using. And this can be technical stacks, like for example, I'm an Avid Vim user, or this can be the shoes I'm wearing, I won't say because it's an advertisement. <laughs> Uh, and this is how your stacks looks like. It's uh, right now in a public beta. And when we started your stacks, we sit down and started thinking about the architecture of the application. We wanted to build something to last. So our first thought when we look at all our technical decisions during the years, moving to GraphQL was actually the best one. So the new application is what I call GraphQL first application. Like GraphQL is not just a middle layer. It basically powers everything. And so far, uh, near under the project, that pays out quite well. And when you design a system, it's important to say what's the value for your system. Like when, I, when we designed your stack, the goals were having a good defaults, having good code organization, to isolate dependencies because we know how often React Router changes their API. Uh, oh, I see who have updated this recently, or Webpacks. Also, we needed to be extensible and reusable because we are a startup, we changed a lot. But for me, the most important one is the last, that might should have been first, make the common operations easy. When an engineer needs to work on something, it has to be easy for them. The best part should be the easy part for them. Also, all our engineering team is full stack engineers. Everybody on the team works from feature definition to back end to front end to fixing CSS to sometimes talking with some of the, our users why something doesn't work or works. 
Uh, on the front end, uh, we are with React. Again, as I mentioned, we also use GraphQL to Apollo. We are TypeScript, uh, so everything is type saved. I will talk a bit about that later. We use Next.js because it handles our uh, SSR needs and it also hides Webpack from us, <laughs> which is very nice. Uh, on the back end, the way we work is we have we are in, in AWS with Kubernetes. We have a cluster of Next.js front-end apps which do, do the server-side rendering for us. We have a cluster of Rails GraphQL servers and some background jobs in Rails. A lot of times when people talk about GraphQL, uh, they, they say all the positive things about the front-end stuff. And a lot of people from the back end imagine this when they tell them GraphQL, oh, it's so, this is so cute on the front end, and if you took it from the back end side, it's like crap. And actually, it's not like that. In my experience, what I have found out is actually my back end code is a lot better when I write GraphQL because it's more structured and more closer to my domain. So if I look at my application as a funnel, I have this big bulk of business logic on the front end, which talks with React, then translates to Apollo, which is my GraphQL layer. GraphQL connects it with my backend. I use the GraphQL Ruby gem. We have Ruby on Rails to talk with our databases, data storages, and we have a bunch of user logic. The important things we have is the business logic. Like all the other thing is kind of a plumbing. <laughs> And like we use Apollo, for example, and I, one, one thing I really like about Apollo, it's very, it's very flexible and very battle-tested, but working with React, Apollo, it's a bit like that. <laughs> like you get the blueprint to build something and you have this small IKEA too and you have to build the whole staircase yourself. And a lot of times if you don't plant ahead, if you don't spend a little bit of time, you're in this situation where you've painted yourself into a back corner. So this is something we do quite a lot. And this is one of the most, the biggest takeaways from this talk, I think, is okay, it's great that we have those tools like Apollo, GraphQL, and they're very flexible, but when we're working on a product, it's better to dress those things in, into your own utilities, into tools you actually built which serves your needs and make it easier for engineers. I'm a very visual person, so this is how I imagine that. We have this team, which is the library. We put them in those robots, and they combine into our application. This is like how I imagine the whole flow. And I'm going to talk about that when we start with GraphQL, it's really important for us to start with a good schema structure. Like, we already, earlier today was mentioned uh, that connections and the way how we do pagination in GraphQL is really important. Because we have, hopefully we have a lot of data and we don't want to send it to the client at part. So the connection API, is, is, this is how it looks like. Uh, the connection API comes from Relay, it's part of uh, the library specification and pretty much almost everybody uses this structure nowadays because the, uh, the, the creators of GraphQL use that for their feed. <laughs> and this is like edges, nodes. And there is one cool feature about that. You can have a feed which you can read backwards, but you can read forwards. Like you can jump to a random page and just scroll up and have it there. One thing missing to the connections though is something we added as an own extension, like this is how we started to evolve the schema design. So for example, our connections all have this total count uh, field, which says, okay, it's good that you have an infinite scrolling list of things, but how much things you have actually. So this is uh, one of the extensions we have. And let's see this page. Like this is your stack two days ago. Today it might be quite different. Uh, and let's see how this thing is built. So this is basically how it front-end query looks like. Uh, we have our edge node, uh, which is the home page feed. It's basically an infinite scroll of list. Uh, it, we get the first 20 item after a cursor, which is the last thing. Uh, 
we have uh, we, we care about the end cursor and does it have a next page so we know when we're scroll down. Also we used we're very heavy users of fragment, like basically every React component in our system has a fragment, and we use this f great feature of GraphQL of nesting fragments. So this is how we load the main page. And here is something for the sidebar. Like sidebar is something you need on the first page load. You don't need to, to get it afterwards. So a pattern we have built, uh, we are using internally, is using directives to cut parts of the query based on the variables. Like in, in, in various places, we need to load extra data based on a variable and we use the skip and include directive. So for example, if I, I'm doing a load more loading of data, I just skip that and I don't load it. Uh, you can make this by having two queries, but then you have to keep those two queries in sync. So having them in a simple query, yeah, it's a bit more mouthful, but at least it's at one place. And having this, again, is a lot of code. Like imagine like you have to write this code, and every time you are looping to the edges nodes, it's quite boring. Like you have to say, okay, uh, home feed that edges, map node, get me the thing I need, and it's too much code. So what we built is we're trying to simplify. Like this is basically copy paste of, our, of the code of our create page. Uh, we have this function called create page, which basically creates a wrapper about Apollo to build every page we have. Notice this here. This is a thing which was also mentioned generics. So from every GraphQL fragment and query, we use Apollo to generate TypeScripts. So everything in our schema is type saved. And for example, if we remove a field on the server, our CI checks, does anybody uses that? And that's a very easy way for us to refactor our schema. Like basically our CI tells us if we break something with, uh, uh, with the schema. And the nice thing about the types and generating types is one trick we are currently building for the mobile app of your stack is we're going to have the schema needed for every mobile version we currently support, put it in an S3 bucket, and every time the CI runs, it's, when we change the GraphQL schema, it's going to tell us that somebody breaks some app version we have. And this is something really cool where we didn't have with REST. So the nice thing about create page is it, it's basically the entry point for our application. Like it, it wraps Apollo, it wraps the page state machine, like it reads, okay, uh, loading state, error states, it knows how to interpret GraphQL errors, it knows what to do when, the when something doesn't exist. We have a simple field which is require login, which, okay, if the user <laughs> is not logged in for a certain page, we show them a loading screen. When they log in, they go back to the proper page. We have a required permissions. Can this user actually see this content? We have required feature for feature flagging and other cool things. And over the time, we have added some of that. We are planning to add a bit more. But the nice thing is we have this abstraction, which is a page because we are doing web. It's build of pages. The other thing which you can see here, which is quite clear, is this little friend here called infinite scroll. And this is our component which deals with infinite scrolling. So you basically give it a connection, tell them, okay, which is the connection path in the query I care about. You pass the fetch more function from Apollo, and this would automatically show you the loading animation when you go to the end of the page, make the query, get the cache, update Apollo cache, clean this up, check if there is next pages, clean up its events, and do all the stuff everybody's too lazy to do. Uh, the other thing is it actually loops through all the stack items from the connection, so you don't need to remember that the connection, how is connection structured internally. Like, we have our own map, uh, uh, GraphQL utilities like map, get, and so on, which doesn't, don't care if you work with an array or a connection, they just look through it. Um, 
And basically, we have a lot of components like that, that know how to map connection, how to interpret GraphQL, how to fetch the data, handle all of that. The nice thing about this is we still haven't done that, but we are planning to, for example, at some point add virtual list here. But if you add the virtual list, it comes to the whole application. Another thing which a lot of people, when they talk about GraphQL mentioned is GraphQL performance. Like if you see this page here, like this list here, how many queries do we perform? Like here is the whole of queries. And basically it's this mathematical formula of one query to get all the list and the, the number of the list times four, which is bad. Like because, <laughs> because our server, we don't have infinite resource. And the thing about 10 plus ones, they, they, they start to be really cute. They're really cute when you start working with them. And at some point, they are like these cute bunnies. They are calling you, know, and they suffocate your application or database server, and they kill you. So how do we solve that? Like the problem in general is we have this structure where I have a list of things, and I want to understand if the current user have liked any of those things. And in the general sense, and this is something I would write the same thing in REST. Like this is something which the solution for this problem, I have not seen it done in a REST application. Like having a list of things and seeing has the current user liked, voted, or whatever done with those current things. So you have to do five queries. And in GraphQL, there is this gem in the Ruby land. It's the same, there is similar things in the GraphQL land, in the Elixir land, pretty much every land you want to care about, even Bulgaria land. So it's called batching. And the idea of batching is the way GraphQL processes information as a tree you can actually postpone execution of operations. So instead of making the queries instantly, each query just returns a promise. And when all the leaves are loaded, you just execute a single query where you say, OK, give me all the stack items from this ID, get it back to me, and I'm here. And this is simple, because now we have solved this problem. We have solved our M plus 1 problem. How does, does this look like code? Because again, talk is cheap, show me the code. If we, this is how it looks like in GraphQL Ruby for us to just show, okay, this is the types, this is the stack item type. Uh, in the GraphQL Ruby, we, we use classes because Ruby is very classy uh, to represent information and very DSL-like. So the idea here is for the like field, I just, create a class which is called resolver is liked. And when I create this resolver, I, the code for the resolver, it's a bit messy. <laughs> like I have this optimization, if the current user is not logged in, I just return false, because if you are not logged in, you don't like anything. Uh, if you are logged in, we, we, we get this loader thing from the library, which basically returns a promise which resolves in the end of the query. And the important part is here. We have a perform method which gets all the items we have passed in the top, loops them, get them from a query, and loops and returns them. It's nice, and from one M plus four, we added some magic of batching, and we reduced to M plus three. Can we do better? Of course we can, otherwise I will not ask that. So uh, we have, again, the stack items. And if we notice, we have those fields which are obviously relationship to some tables. Like they're select something from product table where ID is one. And we have those everywhere. So this is very common. And there is built-in tools for that. Like the GraphQL batch gem have this in their examples. I have my own version. You can remember this hash code or see the slides afterwards. Uh, and basically what you can do is use this very long thing which doesn't fit on the slide, graph resolvers association and pass that stuff. Or we build a custom method on this nice base class called base record which we can just say association profile, association profile type, and this automatically handles n plus ones. And now from n times three, we switch to one. Only one query, and the rest of it is batched. Uh, I have written a couple of blog posts, so a bit of shameless self-promotion here, about how to handle M plus one in Rubyland. 
The second part of my talk, I'm going to talk about one of my favorite features of GraphQL. And this is stuff which a lot of people actually are very, when they see GraphQL, they're always focused on the, the querying abilities because it's in the name. <laughs> it's GraphQL, like query language. It's not graph mutation language. But I think mutations is actually the place where I have seen the most clean code in our application. Because GraphQL gives us a unified way to mutate our data, to change our data. So let's have this nice like button. Uh, and let's see how it's going, how its mutation going to look like. Like uh, one of the things about the mutation, and this comes from the relay uh, design, is you pass, you don't pass your whole variables to your mutation one by one, you pass them as a single object. Why? because this makes your code resistant to change. Because if I want to add another, another type of input argument, I don't need to change all my mutations to accept it or not accept it and handle that. So that's a very clean way. Another thing we have done in Product Hunt is make a base mutation which always have the same shape. Every mutation in our system follows that shape. We have a something called node, which is the thing which the mutation have done. 99% of the cases, and we have like hundreds of mutations, they always return one thing. There is one thing to be created. If you need to return two things, you can create a special type to return it. And we always return this node thing. This is the thing which this mutation have touched. And we have tried to follow the connection edges node <laughs> language, just for similarity. We also, for mutations, we, you, there's this very big debate in the GraphQL world how we should handle errors. And what we have decided on the mutation side is use a field errors with a serializable format because all those errors would be presented to the user. A lot of the things which get wrong in the mutation are things which we can present to the user with some useful message. And another thing which was very important for us is naming. So all our mutations follow a naming pattern. And of course, having a base class enforces this. So we have struck to this naming pattern where we have a namespace, object, and action. Think about it like this. We have bookmark create, bookmark destroy, product like, product create, product destroy, team invite, and 200 more mutations. And the nice thing about that, it's you, you, you can open graphical, uh, which is the tool you can make graphical queries, and you can type your namespace or model and have a nice autocomplete with all the actions you can take. And this helps a really nice grouping of data. On the back end, we have this. This is how the uh, like mutation would look like. We have a class, again, because we are classy. Uh, product like create. Uh, we have this special argument record type because we have found out a lot of typing GraphQLs uh, mutations have to abstract records, and we wanted to abstract that, so we created this argument record type, which just accepts a field which is named product ID, goes to product model, tries to find it in the product model. If there is an error, it puts it in the error list and all of that. We have this authorized, which says, okay, only authorized users can actually execute if they don't we return the standardized error, which our tools understand. We say what's returned and we have one perform which actually does that. Like if you come from the Ruby world or maybe Java or .NET world and you have to think about the MVC patterns we have had, what they did was you have to create controllers, you have to discuss where to put validation, where to put authorization. And in this case, you just need to write this piece of code here. Okay, this is my action, I don't care about anything else. And also the other nice things here is we actually have put a lot of authorization around records. Like for example, product update can only load products that the current user can manage. And this integrates with our authorization tools. So we have security built in, in here and it's quite easy to add. Like basically we handle everything on the base level and the engineers just have to define what they need and the action they need to perform. We also have a set of tools for testing. So unit testing a piece of like that is just execute like prepared function and you just test your code and your logic. And let's see the front end. The front end, we again have a fragment which uh, is from this fragment we create types which can, we can reuse. 
And we have two mutations which import that fragment so they make sure they update the Apollo cache properly and everything works as expected. And, or, and since, like, if you think about it, a lot of times when you execute mutations and you see a lot of the Apollo documentation, you have to create either hooks, which is quite nice, or before that, you have to create, like, function as ch children and a lot of that. There was a lot of noise. Like, the code was very noisy. And when the code is noisy, engineers make mistakes because they forget to see stuff. And if you think about it, most of the time, when I execute stuff with GraphQL mutations, I do it with buttons. So we have this but, uh, button that mutation, which basically abstracts away having to do a mutation. Like, you can pass the mutation input, you can pass what happens when you mutate something. If there is an error, it knows how to present this error. It knows how to handle this bug of the user clicking twice or five times. Like, this, you fix that on a system level. Knows how to do optimistic response. And my two favorites, a lot of times you have buttons where the user needs to be logged in to do the action. So marking the mutation which require login here, I don't need to go to the server to serve that. If I get the error, I can still present to the user, but it's better to just have it here so we don't go to the server, we just present the user with a nice pop-up, uh, please log in to do a particular action. And the nice thing about uh, require login, it's actually a string, so you can actually explain to your user why they need to log in, because a lot of times you click something and they say login, and you're like, why? <laughs> the other thing which makes the GraphQL mutations and having a standard format for mutations and tooling is one of my pain points, and a pain point for life of everybody who has done web, or everybody else, is forms. Like, if you think about this form, it's very standard. And what we have is we have something called form mutation. And form mutation does the same as form button, but for forms. It wraps our form library of choice. In our case, we use final form. But looking at the, the form, you actually cannot know that. It wraps the Apollo mutations life cycles. It knows, it makes our form to look consistent. It has some cool features like uh, custom imports and all of that. It executes a mutation. It knows how to read the result of this mutation. It knows how to present the errors to the user. It knows how to cache, update the Apollo cache when it needs to be nushed a bit. And basically have all those things in place. And basically this was what I wanted to talk about today. Like the most important thing I want to remember is that with GraphQL you can not only write better front end, you can also write better backend. Like, actually, I like GraphQL more as a backend engineer because it makes me solve things on the core level and just not worry about stuff. And I still have ways to optimize. Like, we, I haven't talked about that you can actually cache fields, uh, execute fields in uh, parallelization. Also, when you work with GraphQL and you have this opportunity, integrate your front end and back end tools to talk the same language, not GraphQL, but your own version of GraphQL schema. Like, create schema rules. Also, don't be afraid to create your custom tools, like creating a, a, a base mutation which extends the native library. It can be a bit daunting for some people. Why? I, I just need to use this library. The other one is it's really important to solve the core concerns of your applications very early on in its life cycle because this is something we don't have much time to deal with later in the project life cycle. Like when we have to fix bugs, ship features, uh, like work with dying servers and all of that, and we are wondering, okay, how do we do authorization now? You won't do the make, the make the good decision. Make those decisions early, enforce them on a system level, uh, and make your life easier, like naming conventions. It's really hard to add naming conventions after the fact because everything, everybody is different and everybody already has their own opinion. So yeah, that was what I wanted to share with you today. <laughs> That's all, and yeah, here is the slides. And I have 39 seconds on stage. So no time for questions, sorry. If you have any questions, you can find me walking around here without internet. So come and talk with me. <laughs> because I don't have internet and I cannot talk with anybody else. <laughs>